Well, good morning. My name is uh, Solomon Gifford, and I work with a uh, company, Black Mesh. Um, we are a managed hosting company, and I've been there for a little over a year now working on a product called Cascade, and I will give a little demo and announcement about that at the very end of the presentation. But to give you a little bit of a background of where I got started um, in, in DevOps, I used to work for a large nonprofit in D.C. that had a large Drupal site, and um, originally it was just a, a um, HTML silo, um, but we converted it to Drupal 5 way back in the good old days. And um, over time, um, it was neat that needed to be upgraded to Drupal 7, and so I led that effort. But when I first got there, literally all of the devs were doing their development on a single box. It was a shared, shared server. Um, hot fixes were done on production. Um, we had a developer who was testing uh, joins out on the production database, and I kid you not, the database was going down weekly, um, sometimes daily. And, um, you know, a number of these issues, um, you know, were leading to other problems. And as I was promoted to the director, which was more like Drupal lead, um, we made some changes. Uh, we moved to Git so that we could track our changes better. Uh, we moved to scheduling our deployments so that we're not deploying at just any time of the day. Um, we created a, an environment for every developer so that developers weren't stepping on each other's work. And we had a true load balance staging environment. Um, and by the time I was done, um, our databases had over two years of uptime. Um, we had much, um, many fewer errors in terms of taking things to production. And of course, um, increased availability to the user, which was the most important thing. Um, this was a high-performance website of over 100 million members. I'm sorry, 1 million members. So you can kind of get a little bit of a picture of, of the size and the scope of what I was dealing with. So again, you know, this led me at, at the end of that process to working for Black Mesh Hosting Company because I had just essentially gone through um, doing this for a single customer, and they brought me on to essentially set up a system to, to give our customers. And we'll talk about some of that at the very end again. Um, so today's presentation is on the idea of local versus uh, remote development. And um, to give you a little bit of a preview of where we're going in the presentation, um, we do local development, we can do remote development, but there's the advantages of each. And we're going to kind of talk about how to use some tools um, mainly Jenkins, but also talk about Vagrant and HAProxy, use these tools to essentially keep these environments in sync. And um, if you are already a Vagrant expert, if you are already a Jenkins expert, if you already know a little bit about HAProxy, then this presentation may not be for you. Um, but hopefully um, everybody can get something out of this. Um, all right, so I guess I just said this. Um, but yeah, Vagrant, HAProxy, Jenkins, and of course, um, at the very end, we'll talk about something called Cascade. All right, so I guess the question that I would ask, um, how many of you do your development on a laptop or a desktop? Okay, so majority of you. How many of you do it remotely by SSHing into a server? Okay, smaller, smaller number. How many of you do both? Okay. Sorry, so most of us are already doing both. And I would guess that there are reasons that you're doing it um, in both locations. So let's talk about local development for a second. So um, when you're talking about local development, you have low network dependence, right? So you don't have to worry about if the internet's out or if you're on a train, you're on a plane, um, you can do your development anywhere. Um, you can also use your local IDEs, your tools, um, each developer has their own workspace. Of course, you can do that remotely as well, but this is your workspace. You can uh, muck it up all you want. Um, and then, of course, there's the concept of security, right? So um, if you work for the government, sometimes it could take a week or even uh, months to get access. Um, you know, as the director of technology for the previous organization that I was a part of, there was a guy that I did not want to have access even to dev. This guy just screwed everything up, you know, all the time. How many of you had one of those in your organization? Uh, if you, how many of you are that guy? No, just kidding. Um, so hopefully um, you're seeing that there's maybe reasons that you have to do local development or many times um, 
want to do local development. On the other side of the coin, we have the concept of remote development. Um, one of the biggest challenges with, with, with local development is demos, right? You have to actually bring your computer to someone and say, hey, see what I'm doing? Or, of course, you can use Join Me or some other um, conferencing system. But it's not like you can just send someone a link and say, hey, go check out what I've been working on. Where, obviously, with remote development, you can pass somebody a URL. Um, how many of you work with really large databases? All right, so, so a number of you. And I assume that you don't want to bring those databases down to your local environment. Uh, it's just not feasible. Uh, or even large file sets. Um, also, when you're talking about integrating with, um, with APIs or Solar or Remcache, et cetera, when you start integrating with some of those, you might not want to set those all up on your local machine. Maybe you don't know how. Um, now, I'm sure that some of you know how. You can do it you know, very easily. But there's a lot of developers who they've never touched those layers of caching. And so they just let somebody else take care of that. And so uh, the point being that if it's remote, if you log into a website, I'm sorry, log into a server, um, that's already been set up. You can just jump into development right away. Um, and then this last point, I think, is, is important as well. So if you have a guy on your team that's your support guy, he's the guy who sets up your new environments or sets up the new projects on that remote environment, then, then you lean on him to take care of that. And so, or maybe you are that guy. And, and the guys around you um, lean on you. But the point is, is that one or two people know how to, how to set up um, all the different caching layers and have the permissions to set everything up. So um, the point is, is that you can, you can offload this to a single person or to a number of people. There was a shop that I recently spoke to. And there was, again, one guy who did all the setup for their organization. And, um, he essentially wasn't developing anymore. He spent his entire life just supporting the other developers. And he was the Drupal lead. And so essentially, he was the guy who should have been doing the most in terms of Drupal development. Instead, he spent all of his time doing other things. So the point is, is that there's advantages to both remote and local development. And we're going to try to see, at the, by the end of the presentation, what can we do to um, do both. Um, so the challenge that we're going to try to um, to solve is how do we keep our remote and our local environments in sync. Now, I say that when I say in sync, you know, some of you probably immediately thought, okay, this is a cron. This is a, this is something that's automatically happening at some kind of frequency, or maybe you're thinking automatically every time I do a git commit, or maybe you're thinking on demand every time I push a button or or, or in, uh, initiate some process. And I would say all of those are yes. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the different ways that you can do it. Um, that may be a combination of, of this. I don't think anybody wants their databases automatically on a cron um, um, overwriting their work. Um, but yes, it can be done. So we're going to talk about Jenkins. So Jenkins is a continuous integration server. How many of you have played with Jenkins? OK, a number of you. Um, so I'm going to assume that before you knew what Jenkins was and you read the definition that it was a continuous integration server, you were like, uh, what's a continuous integration server? And then someone said, well, it's something like Jenkins. And you get yourself into this, um, this loop. And um, I like to, to just say, well, when stuff happens, Jenkins does stuff. And that's, that's my simple, simple, simple uh, um, explanation. So. Um, Jenkins can submit uh, sync code on commit. It can sync databases on demand. It can sync files on demand. And those are the things that we kind of want to do with a website um, when we talk about keeping a remote and a local environment in sync. So when we think about where is Jenkins install installed, I'm going to go through two scenarios today. Um, the two scenarios are, first, Jenkins is installed locally. Um, you're actually going to install Jenkins on your machine. I'm not going to actually watch, you know, do a demo of it being installed, but we're going to talk about some of the issues. And then the second is in a remote environment. So some of you have a dev environment or a machine that, um, that your company will allow you to install Jenkins on, and um, that's another solution. But with both of these solutions, there are some issues that we'll talk about. So for example, um, 
if you're going to commit to a Git repo and your Jenkins is on your local machine and you want your code to automatically check out every time you do a commit, well, somewhere on the web where that Git is hosted needs to have a ping back to your local machine to run that Jenkins job. And unless you're going to set up dynamic DNS or something like that, um, that it's hard to happen, uh, hard to be done. Um, I'm, there's lots of solutions I'm sure you could figure out, but the point is, is it's not not as simple. And I'm trying to trying to you know solve this as simply as possible. And in a remote environment, um, well, again, that remote environment, if Jenkins is in a remote environment, it needs to have access to your machine. And so we're going to talk about setting this up with some with some reverse SSH tunnels. So there's some challenges, and we'll talk about those as we go through. So again, there's two scenarios. We'll talk about one, then we'll talk about the other. So the first one we want to talk about is running Jenkins locally um, in a Vagrant environment. How many of you use Vagrant? A lot of you, great. So how many of you have used Vagrant with a multi-machine setup? All right, so that's, that's what I thought. So I came into this presentation assuming that most of you had played with Vagrant, or at least knew it was, but um, when we talk about using Vagrant in a multi-machine environment, um, there's limited documentation out there. I mean, it's, it's out there, but there's lim less, less information out there on using Vagrant um, in a multi-box mu multi setup. So we're going to talk about that, and um, we're going to set up or show you a Vagrant file uh, where one of the two boxes is for Jenkins, and then the other box is for your development. And in this scenario, you could essentially have multiple other boxes for different projects if you wanted it to be done that way as well. So we're not just talking about two, we're talking about n plus one. All right, so over here I have a Vagrant file. And how many of you have edited your Vagrant file? All right, so about a third of you, okay, or a little less than a third. So for those of you that have edited your Vagrant file, um, it's, it's a Ruby um, uh, file, and you really don't have to know Ruby. You just have to figure out where to copy and paste, right? Um, so with a multi-box Vagrant setup, each one of these um, config.vm.define regions is a box. And so I'm going to scroll up and down in this file so you, just so, so that you can see. At the very top, we have some initialization of, of scope. At the very end, we have an end statement. But between that, we have these two boxes that are, for, that are in a config.vm.define. There's one at the bottom there, and you've already seen this one here at the top. And so I'll go through very briefly what this file is doing and um, so you can kind of see how this is working. But um, the first one here, we, we're, we're giving it a name, Jenkins, and um, we're giving it a scope of the Jenkins server, and we're giving it a host name of Jenkins.blackmesh.com. You could name that anything. I chose blackmesh.com simply because I work for Blackmesh. And then I give it a box URL or a box name. If the box is already downloaded on your computer then uh, with Vagrant, then you can just give it a box name um, that's local, or you can give it a, um, a Vagrant name from um, HashiCorp's um, uh, Vagrant boxes, and it will automatically download. Um, you could also give it a URL. There's another uh, setting, jenkinsserver.vm.url. You could actually give it an alternate URL so that the boxes are downloading from some other location. And um, well, the point is, is there's a lot of boxes out there. If you do a Google search for Vagrant Box, you'll see a pile of them. So in this um, example, I have a Jenkins demo box that I've created. But if you're creating a box, maybe you just want to grab um, a CentOS or an Ubuntu or Debian um, box and, and start from there. Um, again, if you Google the web, you can find a bunch. Be careful, obviously, from a security perspective. You don't want to just be downloading anything, so try to kind of trust the people that you're downloading from. Um, I like Puppet Labs. Um, they have some good CentOS um, boxes, so my second box here you'll see is a, is a CentOS 6 Puppet Labs um, box. All right, so then you have a region. We call it the provider, so most people working with, uh, with Vagrant use VirtualBox. You can use VMware as well. And you can give it a number of CPUs and amount of memory here. And um, 
for Jenkins, I'm going to go ahead and give it two, but it could have been one just as easily for, uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the RAM. And the final um, three lines set up the network. And this is really where I'm going with this. We need to set up a network between these two boxes. So we have our vagrant box, we're gonna have a box, we're gonna have our local development box. They need to connect to each other, they need to talk to each other. And so we want to put them into the same network. And so we're gonna create a private network. Now we could have set this up as a public network, we could have done bridging, we could have done other things. It's a little bit more complicated and I'm a guy that likes simplicity so that I can redo this over and over and over again. Um, so my model, private network. Um, so Here's the IP address. I'm assigning it this IP address. I decided what to, you know, what numbers to give it. And you'll notice for the second box, I gave it a different number, so I'm not giving it the same IP address. And I need to forward the ports. So here's another, for those of you who've played with Vagrant, you know that whenever you run something in Vagrant, um, it's not, <laughs> Uh, when you're when you're sitting out on the host machine, you type in the URL of something that's running on the Vagrant box. Um, it's not the same port number, right? So, if you are, uh, you know, web runs on port 80, port 80 um, on the Vagrant box isn't port 80 outside of the of the Vagrant box. Which means every time you type in a URL, you're typing colon then a port number, and um, we'll talk about how to get rid of that in a minute. But the point is that this port 80 internally to the box is getting mapped to an external port. And you can determine, you can decide what you want that to be. In this scenario, I chose 8111 um, for no real reason. Um, and I'm also going to allow this to connect over um, securely over port 443, which is being mapped outside to 18443. The last thing I'll show on this um, Jenkins server is that there's the concept of a provisioning script. And this is a number of commands that you want to run when this box is created. And there's a bunch of provisioners out there. There's Puppet and Chef and Ansible provisioners, or there's the shell, which means you can just write some commands and when Vagrant spins up this box, it just runs, um, runs those commands. Um, so I'm doing it in line. It's just going to do a service Jenkins restart um, every time this start every time this box comes up. Now, I don't have to restart Jenkins. I'm only doing this for purposes of demo. Um, but whatever you wanted to be installed or run when this box comes up, you could have done this. And in this scenario, I've put the run always meaning do this every time the box comes up, not necessarily just when it comes up the first time, which is what would happen if I didn't do run always. All right, so hopefully you're seeing that this Vagrant is allowing us to spin up a box. It's using VirtualBox. Um, it's spinning up a, a box called um, Jenkins. And um, Jenkins isn't necessarily installed on it yet. For my for purposes of the demo, I went ahead and installed it on here already. but um, uh, but if you're spinning up a brand new box, yes, you are, you are going to have to install Jenkins on this. And then I have a second machine that I'm spinning up, and it's a CentOS 6.6 um, box. I grabbed it off of Puppet Labs, and um, I'm not going to go through all the other pieces of this since it's very similar to the previous, but I will show you this one thing called the synced folder. Um, for those of you who've already used Vagrant, you know that you can sync from within your vagrant to um, within your vagrant box, you can you can mount that outside so that your your code is kept in sync. And so, my var www local dev inside my vagrant box is mapped to um, to this on my on my Mac. All right. So now you're an expert at, at vagrant multi box setups, and so you can create your vagrant box. All right, so back to the slides. Once I've, once I've done that, I need to do something like Vagrant up local dev, Vagrant up Jenkins. This is what actually starts up those Vagrant boxes. And um, if I want to log into them, Vagrant SSH local dev. So for those of you who've already played with Vagrant, um, you know some of these pieces already. 
um, vagrant halt would kill a machine, or it will shut down a machine, vagrant destroy would kill a machine, allow you to restart it all over. But back to the original scenario, we're trying to um, set up one box for Jenkins and one box for development. Now, if you're like me, you don't like all these ports. So um, hopefully you'll get, for those of you who use Vagrant, hopefully uh, you'll get something out of this next little piece of the presentation. Um, when we talk about um, all these port mappings, um, if you're using Jenkins especially, Jenkins will redirect often to port 80. So if you're running Jenkins within a Vagrant box and it redirects to port 80, and of course you're trying to run this on port 8111, then you're going to constantly um, get errors in your, in your web page. So we've got to find a way to, to map the ports without us um, having to type them in every time. So how many of you have played with HA proxy? One. Well, so you all came here today for the HA proxy. Okay. <laughs> so HA proxy is a, is a really um, nifty um, piece of software. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on Windows. But essentially, it'll allow us to map different ports and different URLs into Vagrant. Um, you can kind of think about it as, um, as, as similar in a way to Varnish, uh, not from the caching perspective, but from, from the other uh, things that it, that it has. Um, so essentially to start HA proxy, we're going to obviously we need to install it on our, on our machine. Um, but to start it and stop it, there's not a start and stop command except for you're going to run it from the, from the terminal, HA proxy dash F meaning I'm going to pass it a configuration file, and I'll show you an example of a configura configuration file. And to shut it off, again, there's not a stop command, but um, we can always do a sudo pkill ha proxy to kill it, and that will shut it off. Or, of course, just restart your machine. Um, pkill is a little bit easier. So I'll show you an example config file here. Okay, so an HA proxy configuration file has a couple sections at the top, um, a global section and a default section. I'm not going to go into what each of the lines mean. You can Google them. But essentially the, the, the important thing here is we're running this as the staff user um, on the staff group, which is um, my default group um, on, my Linux, on, my, um, on my Mac here. And we're running this as a daemon, and it's... It also supporting SSL. Um, it's globally logging, et cetera, et cetera. Here, here's some timeouts. The important, the important parts down here are down here at the bottom. So, I set up two front ends. You see front end uh, here and here, and I'm going to name them arbitrarily: HTTPS front end and HTTP front end. Um, sorry. So I'm creating two front ends, and that's essentially saying I'm going to listen on some port use some rules, and then redirect those calls to somewhere else. That's a simply, that's, that's a big picture of what HA proxy is doing. So bind 443, obviously, is HTTPS. So our front end for the HTTPS is listening on port 443. And then the rule that I give given it is essentially, if I see Jenkins.blackmesh.com in the URL, then it's going to do something with this. So this is a listener on port 443 for the URL jenkins.blackmesh.com. And when it sees that, it's going to use the back end of Jenkins server. So I've got to define Jenkins server somewhere later in my file, but I've set up my listener. I'm also going to set up a second listener to listen on port 80. So I'll call this the HTTP front end, bind port 80, and I'm listening again to jenkins.blackmesh.com. And if I see that, I'm going to use the back end of Jenkins server. And then finally, in this front end, I'm still listening on port 80. I'm also going to add two more listeners, one for d8.example.com and then another one for localdev.blackmesh.com. So think about 
the websites that you're setting up within Vagrant on your development box, you obviously want those to map as well. And so here, um, the um, host, the H, HDR underscore end is essentially saying if your URL ends with um, d8.example.com, then I'm going to use my development server. All right, so big picture, I have two front ends, both listening on different ports, and if I see jenkins.blackmesh.com on both of them, I'm going to redirect the traffic to the Jenkins server back end. If I see these two URLs, da.example.com or localdev.blackmesh.com, it's going to use the development server back end. And I have those back ends defined down here. So back end Jenkins server is essentially saying, if I see uh, it coming in as non h um, not HTTPS or non-secure, redirect it to secure, and then take the traffic, send it to localhost on, on port 18443. My back end for my development server is saying if it's coming in as HTTPS, redirect to HTTP, and use the back end development server, which is localhost port 7082. So, what this is, once I run this, it's going to be listening for jenkins.blackmesh.com, it's going to be listening for d8.example.com, and it's going to be listening to localdev.blackmesh.com, and it's going to redirect those traffics to the right port on my vagrant boxes. So that's what we have been able to set up. All right, don't forget your, to add those domains to your local host um, and Etsy hosts as well. Um. Okay. All right, so that scenario, I, I, I gave you all the stuff about Vagrant. I gave you all the stuff about... Um, HA proxy just to set up that scenario that Vagrant was installed locally. But I said at the beginning that we could have Vagrant either installed locally or it could have been installed remotely. So in the other scenario that uh, Vagrant, I'm sorry, that Jenkins is installed remotely, well, we've got to have some way for Jenkins to reach back onto your local machine. Again, the first scenario, Jenkins was installed locally on a Vagrant box. Now Jenkins is going to be installed remotely. Well, in this scenario, all we have to do, once we have our single Vagrant box set up, that's going to be our development environment, we've just got to use auto SSH or some other, um, some other mechanism to set up a, a, an SSH tunnel. And in this one-liner here, we are mounting, or I'm saying binding, port um, 10100 on that, lo on that remote box, wherever Jenkins is installed, I'm, um, I'm making that port essentially port 22 on my local box, meaning that I can SSH to localhost and that port on the remote box and it will have access to my local machine. So I'm creating a path down to my local machine. Again, I'm trying to keep these um, environments in sync. I've got to create the connections. I've got to create the paths. Um, I'm not a network guy, um, so I can't explain the rest of this. Uh, well, I can try, but let's not do that. All right, so once I've installed Jenkins, once I've set up um, my, I've decided whether it's going to be local or remote, um, there I have um, my, my front page for Jenkins. And um, Again, Jenkins, I'm not going to go through an install of Jenkins. It takes, it takes a little bit of time. You've got to set up Java, which is probably the hardest thing you'll, you'll encounter, which isn't too hard, but obviously um, you do it. Um, and then you can create these jobs. So in this page, you see I have four different jobs or five different jobs. And um, I'll talk about these a little bit briefly in a little bit. OK. So. Um, Let's go ahead and set up Jenkins, and we're going to have to set up 
first um, a plugin in Jenkins, um, the GitLab hook plug plugin, and I'll show show you why in a minute. Then we're going to add a webhook to Git or to GitLab or to Bitbucket or whatever your Git um, happens to be. Um, and then we're going to add a node. I'll talk about that term in a minute in Jenkins. And then add a job in Jenkins. So I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of a demo here. And um, of course, demos are always a little bit scary. We'll see if we can successfully do this. So I have Jenkins running on this machine. And if you want to know where to add um, plugins, here's the manage plugins. And I've already installed it. But essentially what I would have done is typed in git, um, what was it, git, well, if I, I'll just say, if you type in the word git, you'll see all the different available ones or the installed ones or whatever. Um, I'm typing too many things here. Um, so you can install plugins, but the one you're looking for is the git hook plug plugin. That's already been installed. Once you've done that, we need to do two things. So Jenkins has this concept of a node. A node is a machine that it has access to. So um, I've already set up three nodes here. One comes by default. When you first log into Jenkins, it has access to the machine that it's already sitting on. That's always called the master. But we want it to have access to two more machines. One is our local environment. One is our remote environment. So I've already set up two nodes, and I'll go through the configs here, of local dev and remote dev. And so these, again, these nodes are just machines that it has access to. So I will go ahead and look at the configurations for local dev. So I'm going to name it local dev, and it has, has to have a directory that it starts in, a home directory, if you will. And because I'm using the Vagrant user, I'm going to use home, home Vagrant. If you have another user you've set up on the machine, then you can use that as the home directory as well. The concept of a label, most of you will be familiar with because we're all in the Drupal world, but a, a label is simply like a taxonomy tag. And I can then later tag jobs with that same taxonomy tag. And that means that that job runs on this node. And so it's just a way to connect and associate a job to a node. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and label this local dev. I could have named this anything. It does not have to be the same as the name of the node. But for simplicity, I went ahead and did that. I set the only build jobs with label restrictions matching this node. I don't want other jobs just randomly running on my local, on my local machine. I only want ones that have been explicitly said to run on my machine to run on my machine. The launch, method, the launch um, uh, method here is the default to SSH in. And now I have to give it where to log in. So in this, um, in this version, remember I was talking about Jenkins can be installed remotely or locally. In this version, um, Jenkins has been installed remotely. And so I need to connect to that SSH tunnel. And so 127.0.1, and if I actually open up the extra advanced information here, you'll notice port 10100. If you had been on your remote, uh, if this had been um, um, on a local machine, on a Vagrant machine, then you'd have used the, the IP address from that Vagrant file that we showed earlier. The point is, is wherever your location is for, Jen, um, for your local dev, that's the IP address and, and port number that you're going to put in. Uh, the rest of this information isn't, um, isn't necessary. The hardest part about setting up a node, I'll be honest with you, is making sure that Java is installed on the remote machine and setting up credentials. Now, if you do it right the first time, great, and you'll never, never have to worry about it again. But make sure that you set up a user and credentials so that Jenkins can log in as that user or have a user that you don't mind um, putting in the credentials into Jenkins. You can set up credentials with usernames and passwords, with keys and um, usernames. But um, the point simply is that credentials sometimes gives, give, give people a little bit of a difficulty um, setting up. So I've done that for the first node. I'm not going to make any changes here. I'm also going to add that for the remote dev configure. 
I'm, I don't have to show really anything unique except for I'm labeling this something different, and it obviously has a different host. So this happens to be the URL of my remote machine. Now that I have my notes, these are the places that Jenkins can log into. Now I need to create a job. Now, you can ignore these bottom five jobs. They're part of um, Cascade, which I'll show at the very, very end. But this job I created earlier um, this morning, actually. And I will show you some of the configurations. So I give it a name. I restrict the project from only to only run on local dev. Remember, this was that tag that I tagged on the node. It's a Git project. I give it the repo URL for my Git, and also give it credentials so that it can know how to log in and um, access Git. Obviously, this is accessing Git, not accessing the machine. This is accessing Git. So if you're using an SSH key um, to log into Git, then that's, that's what you'll give here. And you can create special credentials just for, um, for, uh, for Jenkins, if you'd like. Not a whole lot else to do except for run commands in a shell. Now, there's a couple ways to set up um, Jenkins in terms of um, what you want it to do. In fact, there's lots of plugins. Um, I'm just going to show one way. Essentially, I'm just going to run two commands. I want it to CD to a directory, and I want it to do a git pull on the org and be mesh dev. If you want to do, add, if you add, want to add other commands, other checks to see if there's files that need to be checked in first, if you want to modify this to send you an email if certain conditions exist, feel free, go ahead. I'm just going to assume everything's okay and do a git pull um, in, my, in my little example here. And so what this should have set up is Jenkins is now ready. Anytime I commit to that branch that I just associated with that job, it should take the, those two commands that I gave at the end of that job and run them on the node that I associated with that job. So that's what should happen. One final piece that I need to set up, and that is that over in my GitLab or Bitbucket or wherever I have my um, Git repository, I need to set up a webhook, and this webhook is going to be the URL of my Jenkins forward slash GitLab build now. And what this does is anytime a commit is done to this branch, then Git or my GitLab in this, which is like GitHub, by the way, um, it's just installed locally so that I could do this for a demo. Um, but GitHub will fire off this hook and tell Jenkins, hey, he just committed something. Go do your thing. And remember Jenkins, I said at the very beginning, when Jenkins, Jenkins is essentially um, something happened, I need to do something. Well, that something happened is that this hook was fired. This hook was fired because you committed something. So I should, again, demos are always scary. Um, here's my local dev. I have a a nice Drupal image here. And on my remote dev, I have a similar image or the same image. And I'm going to see if I can't um, copy a different image. All right, so that should be the right one. So cat ascii 2.html into ascii.html. Now, right before this presentation, I found that my hook, for what, some reason, was not firing. And it's a, it's a GitLab um, issue. So I'm going to manually test this hook. But what you'll see, as soon as I did that commit, Jenkins should start to run. Unfortunately, I can't show, it, show you it running because it has already run. It ran, and here it is. And here's the output of it running. And the point simply is, is that it took this file, which we had changed to this file, 
and copied it to my local environment successfully. So essentially what we saw is I committed from my remote environment and it checked that out immediately on my local environment. And so now I've kept my code in sync on a, on a commit. Now I'm not going to show you how to do a database or syncing files. I hope you can think um, through that essentially a database. Let's think about the steps. We're going we're to export the database on the remote. We're going to copy that file to our local. We're going to then import that from our local into the new, into the new location. Um, we might want to um, first back up the local so that we have a backup of it. Obviously, when we're talking about file and disk space, you've got to be careful. Um, let's think about files, for example. Uh, we can do an rsync from the remote to the local or vice versa. And so in this job here, instead of the commands being to, you know, get pull origin bmesh, it could be those list of commands that I just mentioned. So either, you know, dumping a database, rsyncing the file over, and then doing an import, or in the case of files, just doing an rsync. I know it's a little bit of hand-waving, but there's a lot to show. Okay. All right, so the last thing I want to show for the last few minutes here, for the last year I've been working on a product called Cascade at Black Mesh. And here's the cool announcement. Um, we're going to be open sourcing this within the next uh, six months or so. And um, hopefully others in the room would get involved in the project. But essentially what it is is a workflow tool. So we all know that um, uh, Commerce Guys has platform.sh. The uh, Pantheon has their platform. Um, and, uh, Acquia has their platform. We are creating, it's probably not, it doesn't have as many features yet, but we are creating a sim similar type product, um, and we're open sourcing it. And um, yes, in the end, it's just glue around Jenkins and around Cascade. I'm sorry, Jenkins and GitLab. And we hope to have it support not just GitLab, but GitHub and, and Bitbucket and other Git repos at some point in the future. Um, and maybe even other um, continuous integration servers besides Jenkins at some point. Um, but, our, but our model is to essentially create a set of scripts and a set of um, uh, command line options that allow us to set up all the things that we just talked about today, not just for local to remote, but also from lo local to remote to, to staging to production, to a, a full uh, suite of... Um, of a tool. Uh, we currently have some customers that are using this, um, so it is a product that we, we do have at Black Mesh, um, but the, our big drive now is to open source this, um, and we're working on that. And I'm not going to go through all the different pictures of how this works, but essentially um, get, um, Jenkins is, a, is, is using Ansible, which um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ansible, but it, it essentially allows you to log into a machine and do stuff. And um, Jenkins obviously does stuff. So between the fact that Jenkins can do stuff and Ansible can do stuff on a remote machine, it's a nice marriage. And we can use that to um, deploy things from development to staging to production. Um, it can obviously do more than just dev staging and production. Um, it can do a local development, for example. Um, we can have multiple web heads for staging, multiple web heads for production. We can group our sites. Um, it also supports non-standard sites, and what I mean by that is it's not just Drupal, it's also WordPress or Node.js or any other application. Assem essentially, if it's in Git, has files, connects to a database, we can, um, we can do it. So on this machine, I actually have seven VMs running in my uh, Vagrant file. It's a Jenkins machine. Um, it's a local, it's a remote dev, a local dev, staging, productions one and two, and an installer, which um, I just use. So I'll show you a quick little demo of Cascade, and then I will answer some questions if, if there are any. So here's the dashboard for Cascade. And there is a Cascade CLI, a command line version, which also helps um, with setup. So to add a new site or to add a new environment or add a new machine, I'm not going to demo that. If you're interested in that, you can see me afterwards. 
Um, but we have the concept of a group. So we have multiple sites, and the multiple sites, um, multiple sites can be in a group, and so this just allows us to group um, uh, group our sites. The on the right hand side here, we have different machines. You can restart a machine, so I mean, or restart a service on a machine, I should say, and. Um, this is all permission based, so every single button that I click is essentially a permission on the back end. So you can, um, if you're working on a team, some people have access to uh, certain deployment um, uh, paths, others have uh, other, other permissions. Um, it may be that you never want anybody to take a local database and push it to production, um, hint, hint. So in that scenario, you would um, you know, remove that permission from everybody. Um, but I do have a Drupal 8 site, so here was the, that was the groups, here's the site, and I have four environments. So remember at the beginning of the presentation, or this whole presentation is about keeping our local and our development environments in sync. Well, um, here's a local environment. This is actually connected to this laptop. Um, the development, production, and staging machines are, yes, they're in vagrant boxes, but I've, I've removed the network access between them and local dev. Um, so it's, it's simulating these are out there on, on the web hosted somewhere else. And um, if you click on, on the different um, previews, you can see um, what that site looks like. So this is a, um, a demo. This is just a base, basic Drupal 8 install, which I happen to change the permissions on so that I can um, um, execute things without logging in. And so there's a dev. And there's my local dev. And so we're going to change, use the database here. We're going to add some content to the dev. All right, so this is the remote dev. I'm going to add an article, test demo, test demo. Again, demos are always scary. We'll see if this works. So I've added this piece of content to my development. And this I'm going to demonstrate, hopefully, if this works, I'm going to demonstrate taking that database from development and copying it down to my local machine. So this was the local machine. As you can see, I'm refreshing the page here. It's, um, it's, there's no content. And I'm going to deploy the database from development to that local machine. And the way this works, is this is using Jenkins in the background. This is just glue and, and, and an interface around Jenkins. So Jenkins gives a amount of time that um, it um, is estimating that it's going to take. So this is estimating it's going to take about 40 seconds. And the steps are the ones that I outlined earlier. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to um, take a dump of, of the development database. We're also going to do a dump of the local database. We're going to copy the file from our development machine to our local machine. That's the rsync here. And once I've done that, I start an import. And you'll notice that this job is already completed. That database has been moved from my development machine down to my local machine. Again, this was the development machine. This was the local machine. If I refresh this, if everything worked as I intended, then I should see content here. I should see that test content. So I've refreshed, and there the test demo that worked. All right. Appreciate it. All right, so I will end with questions. I think there's a mic over here. If anybody has any questions, I'll be interested in, uh, in answering. Go right ahead. Hi there. Um, we do uh, lots of different applications, not just Drupal. Yep. So, uh, for example, Symfony and uh, uh, e-commerce mm -hmm. um, and uh, PHP-based. But one of the challenges we have is com config, i.e., we have a Symfony application, and the production configuration is different from the development, is different from the staging, and uh, Pretty much every single, well, not every, but it happens quite often that uh, the config files get lost, aren't in Git, or shouldn't be in Git, or should be. So config is something, I wonder what's your view on handling config files? So we have one customer that um, has a similar scenario, 
What we've even done for that customer is we've installed something called GitWatch. And what essentially, it, it's just watching for inode changes on the server. And so anytime a file changes in the config directory, it does a git commit and check in and automatically checks it in. And that, and of course, you can, with, with git ignore, you can exclude certain configs. So you might not want, for example, your, your home page settings to be, to be changed. Um, but essentially, it automatically commits those in. And then the next time changes go live from staging or dev to the next you know, environment, those changes then do go live. Okay. So uh, Git Watch is, is the name of that. Um, that's not something we manage, but uh, it's out there. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> In your scary example, did you demo? Uh, did you git push something, or uh, did the Jenkins uh, fired up using your uh, platform? So in the second in the second demo, it was just a database push. Um, I, I didn't show a code push. In the first in the first example, I showed a code push, which didn't use Cascade. So in that, um, when I did a git commit, it committed to git. When I pushed it, it pushed it up to GitLab. GitLab was supposed to fire a hook, and I, that, that failed. And I pushed the hook manually, but um, I'm not sure. Right before the demo, it, started, it, it failed to, to hit the hook. But um, that's a GitLab issue, not, a, <laughs> not part of the demo. But the point is that when that hook fires, it fired to Jenkins, and Jenkins would have um, and it, and it did check out the code. Cascade does the same exact thing. Again, Cascade is, is, a, is glue, and it's, it's, it's a wrapper around GitLab and Jenkins, and it also does the same thing. In fact, anytime you commit anywhere to those um, branches, it will check out that branch to the right environment. So we have customers, for example, that do a change to production. They pull out the production branch, do a change to production, do a commit, and it immediately checks it out on production, on all the production webheads. Um, I don't recommend, obviously, going straight to production. I'm just giving that as an, as an example. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for coming. And, of course, um, there's opportunity for feedback. So appreciate it. And I'll stand around up here and answer any questions you have. Thanks a lot.